So to give you some case site examples of actually how this is being used, um, in Bahrain recently there's, there are ongoing struggles. And oh, slides aren't happy today, are they? Um, and unfortunately, um, they're being able to identify pro-democracy activists using tools produced in the West, being produced in Germany. This is uh, Abdel Ghani. He was beaten um, for six months, um, presented continuously with his text messages that were being provided by a German company's lawful inception system um, by a company called Trovacor. Trovacor used to be part of Nokia Siemens, who used to be part of Siemens, and they bought it around 2007, which is when this presentation is from. And to give you a very quick idea of the kind of technology that they're, that they're selling here, well, first of all, there's a panther on the motherboard, uh, which is, again, <laughs> they, they really go to town with, with how they sell this stuff. Um, track all major contact persons of the main militant group. Of course, you replace militant with you know, whoever you're interested in. Um, and this monitoring centre hoovers up every bit of data that the government might have access to. So everything from DNA analysis databases, fingerprint databases, telephone billing records, data retention systems, traffic control points, driving licence registers, car rental databases. And then you can do all your fun and games that our intelligence agencies like to do with these things. Speaker recognition, topic spotting, emotion detection and analyse and crunch them. And again, to give you an idea, this is in 2007, this is you know, pre-Twitter, um, and they're crunching through two, 21 million call records in about an hour. You know, this has got a lot cheaper. This can be done a lot faster these days. And now on to Libya, and one of my favourite case examples. This was a French company uh, called Amasis, who sold a mass surveillance solution to, the, uh, to Gaddafi's regime, where it was being used um, to monitor anyone he didn't like, effectively. Um, Heather here from Human Rights Watch, um, when she w walked into the security services building, found her file and found um, the intercepts that had taken place using this French system. And they helpfully explain what they sell uh, and draw distinctions between what they consider lawful and what they actually sell, which is massive surveillance. <laughs> so again, they're doing my job for me, I think, here. You know, they're, really, they're really kind of helping us out. And so no, no longer are you looking for specific people. You're just trying to get as much information on everyone as you can. And again, the, the, the way that they describe this, archive of all internet traffic, smart search engine to recover communications in the past, global search and surveillance of all internet traffic, search a huge one-year archive. And again, <laughs> a, little check, a little checklist for us. Just in case we weren't clear on what they were selling, you know, they don't consider necessarily lawful. <laughs> um, on the left, there's lawful interception, and what they sell <laughs> is massive intelligence, which is why you should pick them uh, on the right-hand side there. And it isn't, just, um, it isn't just domestically, it's also internationally. And so with this kind of technology, uh, Libya also purchased this vast tech technology, again, allowing it to do mass intercept Across, uh, across entire regions. These tools are being used routinely to target activists. They're being used routinely to target human rights defenders, um, those in political opposition. And currently there are no or very, very few export controls on this technology. So any of these companies can lawfully sell this technology to any regime they wish. There was a British company last year called Creativity Software who sold mass location tracking equipment to Iran and when pushed on it by our, by our House of Parliament, our House of Commons, they said they were proud. And they said they acted lawfully. <laughs> and when questions were asked about whether or not they were, it transpired that unfortunately they were. They had not broken any export control rules. And it was only a year later, after fierce lobby lobbying, that we managed to get surveillance technology included as part of the sanctions regime. But sanctions are far too late, and personally I don't like them. I think they harm people more than they harm the government. This is why we need export controls. We need a licensing regime that means that every single time a company wants to export a kind, this kind of product to a country that could use it for internal repression or for human rights violations, they need to get a license to do so, so that there's oversight, so that we can make a choice on it, over it as, as our government. And if they make the wrong ones, we can hold them to account. And the final point I say, because I'm, I'm going on a bit, um, is that in this discussion, what I really want people to bear in mind is that export controls aren't the one-stop shop fix silver bullet fixes the whole problem. Not at all. And if you frame them in that light, then it's hard to, to you know, want to do it. But if they fix 50%, if they fix 
40%, if they do anything to contribute to the limitation of the proliferation of surveillance technology, then they've got to be a good thing. And so with that in mind, that's why Privacy International is pushing for export controls on surveillance technology. Um, it's a campaign that we've been pushing for the last few years, and we're going to be continuing uh, to do so um, uh, over, the, over the next few years as well. So thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we help journalists and bloggers um, if they are uh, yeah, in need. So if, if somebody is beaten up by an authoritarian regime, uh, if equipment is destroyed or stolen, uh, if people need help with immigration uh, or with their, with their visa or even go into exile, uh, we, we help them. Um, so here you see uh, our offices uh, worldwide. Uh, there's a new office in Tunisia now. Uh, and we have about 150 correspondents um, in the whole world telling us uh, from the, from the uh, grassroots uh, what's the situation in the different countries. Um, so why, why do we uh, yeah, uh, join this, this fight uh, when there are NGOs like Privacy International uh, who are working on this and <coughs> doing great work? Um, so for us, uh, the, the situation in Germany is especially severe. As Eric mentioned, there are several firms from Germany selling this kind of technology. Um, and we had information that the German government is even furthering the export of this uh, kind of technology with export credit guarantees. And with they, they do organize fairs in Germany where they invite like the Gulf Cooperation Council um, uh, countries. Uh, and then I, I called there and said, Okay, this sounds interesting. Uh, can I can I join? And they said, Well, yeah. How, how do you know of this? We we didn't invite any journalists. I said, Okay, I'm no journalist. I just work for a journalist organization. I said, Yeah. Well, if you would be from Siemens, but but no. Um, so this kind of thing is is also uh, yeah. They they spend taxpayer money on it uh, really. Um, and from our work, we've seen that more and more journalists uh, are subject to surveillance now around the world. Uh, and this, of course, uh, endangers their own safety, but also the safety of their sources. And um, <coughs> the protection of one's sources is, of course, one of the, uh, the basic things every ethical journalist uh, needs to do and needs to control. Uh, but control is taken from them here. Um, we do believe, of course, that Western governments have a responsibility for human rights and therefore should do something. Um, and we should also bear in mind uh, that the Finn Fischer Trojan, uh, uh, for example, which is produced in Germany uh, mainly, um, is not clearly legal in Germany. So uh, they, they bought it now, the, the federal police bought, bought the Trojan, and now uh, they are checking the source code to see if it would be legal to use it in Germany because we had a uh, our constitutional court made a ruling on the use of such software and technology. Um, so what we do, did we do? Um, to be honest, we, we didn't have much uh, of experience with this kind of campaigning for a specific law and uh, really really uh, going to, to the authorities um, uh, with this. So the first step what, uh, was that we just uh, crafted a position paper and we said, okay, please, government, uh, do stop to uh, do stop these companies from selling, and also uh, stop to to like further the export and uh, make transparent transparent if you have given export credit guarantees and to which countries and to which firms. Um, so, and we very quickly uh, we are now in in a dialogue with uh, different uh, different uh, ministries in Germany. Uh, the, the Foreign Office, uh, but also the Economic Affairs Office. Um, we joined Privacy International and um, the, some other NGOs, uh, ECCHR um, and the two Bahraini NGOs, uh, in filing an OECD complaint, both in Germany and in the UK, against Trovicor and Gamma International. Um, so this is an ongoing process, and let's see what happens there. Um, and then what we did, we have the Enemies of the Internet Report, which you may be familiar with. Um, and this year, uh, we launched a special edition uh, on surveillance and surveillance and journalists. And for the first time, we had companies in the report naming them corporate enemies of the internet. Um, and you see, you see them up here, and I think we talked about most of these companies. Um, we had some very funny reactions 
Uh, so Trovacore said, yeah, we are not building mass surveillance equipment, we only build database systems, relational databases. So that is what they said. Um, and I, I think it, it is not untrue, but it's not everything they do. Like, it, at the heart of the system, there may be a database somewhere. I don't know. Um, so that was very funny. Uh, so Bull Amesis, or Bull Amesis, uh, as, they, as they are called, they said, yeah, you know, we did this, and we, we sold this to Gaddafi, and I don't know, but we sold the company last November, so you can't blame us for it. Like they, they, they sold it to a newly formed company, it's called Naxos, I think they sit in Dubai now, officially. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's the same, it's the same people, so the, the uh, chief engineer that he bought, basically bought it. Um, and Gamma said, yeah, well, we don't sell to these countries. And like, it just ends up there miraculously, I don't know how, how that happens. Um, and Blue Code was also not happy to be on the list. Um, so Blue Code is uh, a little different here because Blue Code uh, builds uh, the systems for internet filtering. Uh, they've been selling to, to Myanmar and to Syria, and that there are many more devices uh, discovered around the world. They said they want to do a full check uh, of their business procedures this year, uh, but yeah, we haven't seen it. Um, so, as Eric mentioned, we also uh, we are also fighting for this kind of ex export control regimes. Um, we think it's important, of course, to develop a targeted approach because you don't want uh, legit legitimate software and technology to be blocked. So, of course, like open source tools like Tor or so should be should be spread around the world. As many people as possible should use it, uh, of course. Um, so that is kind of a challenge, but I think it's 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 workable. Um, of course, you also have to be aware of legal uses of some of these technologies under certain conditions, um, but, but it is, of course, uh, very different, uh, very difficult. Um, and we are targeting the national level in Germany. We are also uh, at the EU level and the international level. It's a Wassenaar uh, arrangement. It's an international uh, arms control treaty. Um, yes, so that's from my side. For now. Thank thanks, you. Thanks very much. I'm going to take a little bit from the export bonus to maybe the import bonus or the, corp the, the corporate um, angle to the public angle. I'm here to talk about the plan of the Dutch government to actually um, introduce a hacking power in the Netherlands. Uh, I work for a Dutch NGO, Bits of Freedom. Uh, we focus on, uh, on defending privacy and freedom of communication on the internet in the Netherlands. Um, and so, this is our Minister of Security and Justice, um, the Google Glasses, I will explain a little bit. And last October he launched a plan to um, give the Dutch police the power to um, hack computers, break into computers, uh, search and destroy data, and install spyware to do basically whatever they like. Um, and uh, maybe well, one of the most controversial points is that it doesn't, um, it's not confined to the Dutch territory, but the Dutch police would also deduce, be able to do so uh, under certain circumstances, although those circumstances are not defined, uh, without the judicial oversight of another other country in that country. Um, so it's uh, quite far-reaching. <coughs> uh, clearly, we are concerned about this, uh, this proposal. Um, it's currently sort of in a consultation phase, so we're giving input, and then um, it will be sent to Parliament probably at the end of this year, because it has to go through several legal phases, but that's just for the legal procedure. Uh, clearly we're concerned, and of course our, our concerns are privacy related, and then cyber security, security related, and then there's sort of the international angle. So I want to walk through these different perspectives, and then um, maybe relate a little bit to what you guys said. Um, so yes, the privacy angle, you can sort of see that of course this is very intrusive for uh, suspects. Uh, because, as we all know, this is not just like a phone which would be tapping one line, but on your computer, computing, uh, computer you, you often use all kinds of different types of communication, and you also have tons of data. So it's like 10 times, if not 50 times, as intrusive as other, other means of, uh, of surveillance. And also, it doesn't relate only to suspects, but of course also to loads of non-suspects. Uh, first of all, because often on your computer there's data of other people, of course because you're communi communicating with other people, but also because there's a couple of things in the proposal which expand this to a large group of people. For example, 
in case if we use botnets, it's not sure or we're not sure whether it would be able to only hack sort of the command and control server or whether it would be able or whether the police would be able to hack basically all the computers in the botnet, which would be um, <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> um, and, and there's a couple of more like uh, more sort of things that would, would, would extend it in a very, um, uh, very far-reaching way. One of those is also the definition of, of sort of computer. It's not only sort of the regulars, it's not just the computer, the router, the server, it's everything related to the internet. So this is where the Google Glass comes in. Uh, it could be the regular stuff, it could be your tablet, it could be your phone, it could also be uh, Google Glass, it could be a pacemaker, it could be a refrigerator that's connected to the internet. And so it's sort of boundless at this point. Um, so clearly there's a huge privacy concern. Um, there's also cybersecurity risks because, of course, if the government has an interest in, in like having uh, a vulnerable software, uh, then it has an interest in keeping those exploits also secret. And if they keep them secret, then of course companies and civilians are less able to, to protect themselves very well. Um, there's also a very interesting question what uh, the government would ask antivirus companies to do with the detection of uh, policeware or government so software. Would they ask the, 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 the companies to sort of exclude this kind of spyware from their, from their, from their detection sort of list? And what would the conse consequence of such a thing be? I think we already showed like policeware or government spyware would be quite interesting uh, for criminals because it gives them uh, the, the possibility to sort of, you know, like operate under the name of the police, uh, and that would be especially true if it would not be detected by antivirus software. So <clears throat> the cybersecurity and the privacy issues are are, are even more problematic in, a, in an international context because you can sort of easily imagine that if the Dutch government is going to hack abroad uh, without judicial uh, oversight from other countries, that that other countries would just see it sort of as a perfect exam example to do exactly the same. We had a Russian journalist a couple of months ago in our office and he was just sort of sitting there and sort of laughing. What do you think my government will do? <laughs> they already do it. Yeah, 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 no, clearly. But it like, would even give them like, more of an excuse to sort of do it like, legally. Um, and that raises the question, of course, like, what will that mean for human rights activists or other uh, uh, journalists? Because clearly countries that will go hacking will not al always limit um, themselves to cyber crime or could also be a very broad definition of, of cyber crime. And they would just enforce their laws, whatever laws in other countries, and that would most likely affect uh, people that, of course, are sort of at the other side uh, of the government. Um, so clearly the, the, the proposal raises a lot of very interesting and difficult questions and, uh, and if, if you would give me an hour I would probably fill it easily. Um, but maybe the relevance to today just to raise a couple of questions. So which bioware is the Dutch government going to use and where are, going to get, where are they going to get it from? The Dutch government is actually already hacking so it's sort of, we have this proposal but it has already happened. Um, in, in the past they used the, the Digitask for they bought the Dig Digitask uh, spyware and that was exactly the spyware that the Chaos Computer Club hacked. Uh, the, Dutch, the Dutch government um, never really sort of showed any concern about this issue. Um, so we're very curious to, uh, to hear how they think they could even be able to use or develop safe spyware. Um, and also, like, what would, they, what would they then do with it? Would they just use it for their own purposes or would it go sell it? <laughs> um, Another very interesting question, and it's just sort of to bring it back to the national co context, is like what is going on in your countries? Because unfortunately, or fortunately, the Dutch government has been blatantly honest about this. Like if you sort of look at events of the Dutch um, police, like they actually sort of say that they're very proud about this hacking. Like, come work for us. Like it's actually sort of how it goes. Um, and so, yes, we know about these incidents, and we now have this proposal, and that is very sad. But a comparative analysis we did with other countries also showed, of course, that like France and Germany have these powers, although they're sort of not sort of in effect now because they don't have safe software. Uh, but we don't know practically what's happening there. Like in effect, are they using it, and how often, and how are they doing that? Because you can sort of suspect that it's actually happening. And the same goes for England. I don't know if you know anything about that, but then there is sort of a hacking power. It's an, ex it's an exception to to uh, 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 a rule. 
um, but it's very vague. And then somewhere we sort of discovered that in between 2000 and 2007 and 2008, there were 194 hacking operations. What does that mean? <laughs> Nobody can tell us. And so it's very interesting and it's very, and it's very striking that we don't have those answers about their own, uh, our own countries. But at the same time, people are very busy with, of course, looking to other countries and, 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 and our own companies are sell, they're selling to those countries far, far away. Um, so that's for my point. Thank you very much. Sorry, that's excellent.